So I want to talk today about the banality of evil, the evil of technical rationality, the idea of the system being in and of itself a perpetrator through action and inaction. One of the ways I want to talk about this is through this baby formula crisis that the United States is experiencing right now. Now, I did another video a while back now about the Ukraine situation. It was a very short one, but one of the points that I wanted to make in that video, which I hope I did make, uh, is that there, there is no one place in a situation like that where you can say, this is when this problem started, or this is who is to blame. Problems like that, and most they're called wicked problems, right? Like problems without a clear, easy source or solution have many, many causes and really represent failures of action, failures of imagination, moral failures, technical failures, all kinds of failures, failures of will that have gone on for decades, if not even hundreds of years in the case of international relations. We have a situation in the United States right now in which parents are having a hard time finding baby formula. And this is really kind of a national crisis at this point. So much so that the federal government has um, issued sort of emergency money um, and has peeled back uh, regulations in order to keep the flow of baby formula coming. And of course, you know, if we want to look at the surface of this, we would say something like, well, it's this company Abbott, I think it's Abbott Pharma Pharmaceuticals or something like that. Abbott makes a great deal of the formula. I think it's something like 85% of the baby formula for government purchase to supply to families who are low income families. And it makes formula that gets bought by a lot of other people too. There are four major companies that supply the vast majority of baby formula in the United States. And the situation with Abbott was that they, um, they got shut down after a voluntary recall you know, of their baby formula. It took, as I understand it, a long time for the government to actually go through, see if they kind of cleaned up their act and, and um, even, you know, like longer in between when this problem got started and when the government actually like even tried to um, recertify this company. So nobody thought in the process of all this, even though COVID and even though, you know, supply chain disruptions all over the place, Nobody really thought about this baby formula situation until it hit a critical mass where like there just wasn't enough and people were actually scrambling for, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? That's one level of problem. The fact that the government didn't do its business fast enough in order to, and maybe wasn't helpful enough in its process of evaluating this company. Previously, the company also obviously had some failures as well. That's one level and we could look at that. We could also look at the failure of the government to not anticipate something that actually in hindsight was kind of obvious that you should keep an eye on these critical food supplies and you should proactively try to prevent some sort of crisis like this. But then if you take a step back as I like to do for some strange reason. I think about why is it that so many of us are dependent upon baby formula, okay? Um, and there's a whole series of decisions that people have made that have made that happen. And probably the biggest is um, thinking that everybody has to work all the time. And in fact, not just thinking it, but basically making it an utter necessity if people want to, not be utterly poor. And so women haven't been able to, many women, I should say, haven't been able to really think seriously about breastfeeding their babies for a long time, or they only do so for a very short period of time because they know that they're going to have to get back to the workplace soon. Um, and so why is that? Because our society values work productivity over um, parental productivity, let's say. Clearly it does. 
And clearly it does, regardless of whether we're talking about Republicans or Democrats, whether we're talking about progressives or conservatives, everybody says people should work, men and women, so much so that I found a few pro-life agencies in the course of doing some research that basically help moms by helping them get back to work. Okay, but if they have this imperative to get back to work as soon as possible, guess what? Their kids don't get the benefit of breastfeeding. And that means, so they say, a little bit of an issue with brain development because it is the best food, it's the natural food. So there's a whole tragic disaster there because our society does not value families enough, clearly does not really value families enough to make sure that parents are capable of doing their number one job, which is to feed and nurture and raise their children, clearly, okay? And so that tragedy happened a long time ago. And then technology came along to supply baby formula because there was a, there was a need for it. Why was there a need for it? Because moms you know, like in, in my case, for instance, as a, as a professional, if I had spent more than six, six weeks, let's say, you know, totally down, right? Let's say I wanted to take a year off. Now, I think it's a little bit better now for professors, maybe at least in some places, but if I would wanted to take a year off so that I could accomplish this adequately, I would have never gotten another job again. Like I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been allowed. And if I decided to, to uh, get a different job, good luck. I wouldn't have gotten it. I would have had to go into a different profession that has led people to ask like, why is this happening? You know, and, oh, it must be this company's fault or it must be the government's fault. And actually it's, and this is the way it is for so many problems. It's everybody's fault. It's everybody's fault going back in this case, generations who decided to value some things over the other, to support a system that values work and money over family, okay? And we all have taken part in that and we all have a responsibility collectively. But then thinking that doesn't make it so because quite a while ago, the system got so rigged in favor of work and productivity that there's no way that if you're an individual who wants to make a different choice that you're not gonna get severely punished for that. To live on one income, for instance, or to have both partners work half time, you're gonna be severely punished by the economy for that and by other people's judgments as well, because they're gonna think you're weird, okay? You're weird if you do that because you're making choices in this system that will impoverish you, okay? But obviously in human history, this isn't the way it's always been. And the idea that most women would not be able to feed their own children naturally would seem to be absolutely bizarre. And then the idea that a country could have a crisis for feeding its babies, even though it's the, the wealthiest country probably in the world is really nuts. So at the root of this is the system itself. In the case of that example, capitalism, okay, and all of the structures that come with it, and then it's exacerbated by the fact that capitalism has developed a huge technocracy, right, both on the, on the business side and on the government side. Now, I've been going through a sort of family health crisis. A loved one of mine is, has had to go into the hospital and is pretty much incapacitated at this point. And what have we spent most of our time worrying about, agonizing over? Not the health situation, which is what we should be focused on and hoping that our loved one gets better, but rather if we're covered at all for the situation. And the darndest thing of all isn't that question because at least, you, you know, if you could find an answer, then you would know what you were dealing with. But no, you have the unknown because 20 or more professionals, all who get paid really well, probably, I'm thinking, are incapable of giving you the straight facts about whether you're covered or not. And so you hear different things from different people as they walk into your room and they say, doom and gloom, you're probably not. And then another one walks in and says, 
yeah, you probably are. And there is no, no one's in charge ultimately. There's no bottom line. And I know that you people have experienced this, whether it's at a university or at a large business that you're trying to like, you know, get your money back for some reason, the product has failed. And, you know, every single person in that process may be a, a nice person. It doesn't matter. None of them have ultimate responsibility and all of them have been told CYA of the business corporation or entity as a fundamental obligation of their employment. And so they're doing their best in a lot of cases. And so that's why I say it's not that there are, that you feel that there are individuals against you, but rather that some sort of a faceless void is against you. And as a matter of fact, um, my buddy Spencer puts it this way, it is the evil of non-being. And I wanna get him on again to talk about this concept of the evil of non-being. I kind of relate it like this, that it is just as much what people don't do as what they do that produces evil. And the system that we have, this in terribly technocratic, bureaucratic system produces a kind of administrative evil, let's say. And the administrative evil that has 20 people incapable of telling you basic facts about uh, your, your rights, your, your, your economic well-being, your health, and so on, or you have like hundreds of people in charge of somehow making sure that babies get fed in a country. And yet no one can actually solve the problem or tell you what is actually going on. That is administrative evil. And it's the same type of thing that happened uh, in Nazi Germany during the Holocaust. I have a book about this. It's called Unmasking Administrative Evil. I can't locate it right now but I would highly recommend that book. It covers not only the Holocaust, but the um, space shuttle disaster, which was caused by a series of, of events um, that were basically of an administrative nature where there was collective responsibility and therefore there was absolutely no responsibility at all. Um, and one thing just happened, led to another, and pretty soon the space shuttle challenger blew apart as it uh, ascended to the skies. That was during the 1980s. So um, why? Well, because why is it administrative evil and why is it like uh, what happened during the Holocaust? Because you're just following orders. And we have created a system where you can't be employed unless you're just following orders. And then when some desperate soul comes along, which unfortunately is pretty much all of us at some point, and says, please help me out. Like, tell me what's going on. Tell me the truth. Can you do this for me? And what you're gonna get is you're gonna get an answer that relates back to the mission of the organization. And number one mission is not to help you, it's to make a profit, to CYA, to make sure that lawsuits don't happen. That is the evil of non-being because each and every individual in that mass is not doing something, is, is, a, is inertia. It's inertia, right? A sort of machine-like um, conforming, right? To the rules of the game, which don't allow for individuals to do anything more than emotional support, which sometimes you get maddeningly, right? Somebody says, oh yeah, like I get it. I've been there. I feel your pain, but they still can't do anything for you or tell you the truth. This is the biggest problem morally that we have. It's not some of these other hot button moral issues that people talk about so much. This accounts for more evil, more suffering, more just, just incredible damage to people's lives and their morale, their spirit than anything else 
in our world. And it's leading us to disaster on climate change too, because even though we all say we want to do something about it and all the governments of the world say they want to do something about it, well, the machine just keeps grinding along. It can't hardly be stopped. This is the biggest problem of our, of our day. And I don't know what else to do except for sometimes separate myself from it and just do uh, what I want. And I guess this is uh, my interest in Christian anarchism is that it is to a certain extent a philosophy of separating and playing ball with certain people, so to speak, playing ball with certain people, cooperating with them um, to do some things that are not driven by the, you know, the code, the recipe, the system, government, corporate. And even if it's only partial, right? You, you can only do that some of the time. It still feels human. Some days are, are more frustrating than others. I know you guys can feel my pain because you've all been there. And I suspect that there are a lot of people watching this channel precisely because this kind of stuff frustrates them to no end. It makes them feel like they're not human beings. It's dehumanizing. And um, anyway, whether you, whether you take the class or not, I will be putting parts out um, and I will keep these kind of issues firmly in mind as I go through the class. But if you wanna be in on the full class, then check out the registration information below and uh, I'll see you next week. Bye.